All right, today we're going to start the prologue to The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, without further ado, I'm just going to start reading. The Canterbury Tales, Geoffrey Chaucer, The Prologue. A little bit of background for you. Uh, this is a reminder of some of the things we talked about in the introductory lecture. <clears throat> in the prologue of The Canterbury Tales, a group of a group gathers at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, a town just south of London, to make a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket at Canterbury. At the suggestion of the innkeeper, the group decides to hold a storytelling competition to pass the time as they travel. The prologue introduces the, quote, sundry folk who tell the stories and is followed by the tales themselves, 24 in all. Remember, he planned, I guess, 120, uh, but he only got 24 of them finished. So we're going to start... Um, I guess I went too far there. Um, we're going to start with the text here, and I'm going to read it just like I have with some of the other things this year, and sort of try and break it up. This is not easily to be broken up because it's not written in um, very clear, explicit stanzas or anything like that. It it is written with rhyme. It is it does have a structure to it. This has been translated from Middle English by a guy named Neville Cohill. He's great. Uh, one of the best translators uh, for this piece. So anyway, uh, it starts out, you know, like everything with uh, a little bit of background, uh, a little bit of poetry. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. When also Zephyrus, you can see in the margin here, Zephyrus is the west wind. Um, with his sweet breath exhales an air in every grove and heath upon the tender shoots and the young sun is half coarse and the sign of the ram has run and the small fowl are making melody that sleep away the night with open eye so nature pricks them and their heart engages then people long to go on pilgrimages and palmers long to seek the stranger strands of far-off saints in hallowed sundry lands and especially from every shire's end of England down to Canterbury they went to seek the holy blissful martyr, quick to give his help to them when they were sick. Okay, so the translation of this basically says it's April, it's springtime, and a bunch of pilgrims are headed to Canterbury. Uh, that's that's a quick and dirty translation, but there's lots of interesting things going on here. It's all fancy language, um, and and in fact we can we can go through it. Let's let's just go through it real quick. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the roots. This idea of April showers, right? Uh, March is not a rainy time, and all of a sudden April it's raining. And all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. We're talking about flowers blooming. Um, and the liquor is metaphorically, you know, water, rain coming down the sky. Let's hold on to that word liquor because that's interesting. When also Zephyrus with his sweet breath exhales and air in every grove and heath upon the tender shoot, and the young sun is half course and the sign of the ram has run. That's Aries, the first sign of the zodiac. Um, but, you know, ram. And the small fowl are making melody that sweep away the night with sleep away the night with an open eye. All right, we, we've got some kind of suggestive stuff here that I think is worth noting. Uh, theoretically, these guys are going on a trip to Canterbury, and Canterbury is a religious pilgrimage, right, that they're going to be going on. But one of the things you learn the more you read this is that even though it's a religious pilgrimage to go and, and pray, these people are not particularly religious. Um, some of them are, but most of them aren't. Uh, what this pilgrimage ends up being is sort of like a medieval spring break, and you can actually see that hinted at in the language here. Why are we talking about liquor? Well, it turns out that they're traveling three days there and three days back, and every night they stop at an inn and get hammered, right? So, like, this this trip, this religious trip, is also a fun trip. They've had a bunch of winter, and they've been trapped inside, and they get to go out and, and go on this pilgrimage, and it's very much a, a medieval spring break. They're enjoying spring. we got this hint about liquor. We're also talking about the engendering of the flower. We're talking about birds and flowers. We're going with birds and bees here. You know, everything's springing fresh. And you know what the birds and bees are, are sort of a metaphor for. Uh, you can see that here. We're talking about the sign of the ram. You know, like that's a sexual image. And I think he's he's getting that um, here. Like when you look at um, the small fowls of the birds, they're making melody and they sleep away the night with an open eye. That means they don't sleep because the birds are busy you know, making little birds. And so the idea here is that people on this pilgrimage are probably sleeping away the night with an open eye too. Um, 
so you can go see some of the hints that he's got wrapped in here. And then he tells us that we're going to Canterbury and they're going to see um, Thomas Beckett, um, who's quick to get his help to them when they're sick. So I'm going to go down here. Um, and I think I can get rid of this too. Uh, all right. It happened that in that season, that one day in Southwark at the Tabard, that's the inn, as I lay a nice little picture here for you, ready to go on a pilgrimage and start for Canterbury, most devout at heart, at night there came into that hostlery some nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk happening then to fall in fellowship, and they were pilgrims all, but towards Canterbury meant to ride. So Chaucer is staying at an inn called the Tabard in Southwark, and 29 people who are all pilgrims going to Canterbury enter the inn while he's staying there, right? The rooms in the stables of the inn were wide. They made us easy, all was of the best, and briefly, when the sun had gone to rest, I'd spoken to them all upon the trip and was soon one with them in fellowship. So he talks to them, finds out they're all going to Canterbury, and he's like, I'm going to Canterbury too, right? And they're all together in fellowship. They're all going to Canterbury simultaneously. Uh, Pledge to rise early and take the way to Canterbury, as you heard me say. But nonetheless, while I have time and space, before my story takes a further pace, it seems a reasonable thing to say what their condition was. The full array of each of them, as it appeared to me, according to profession and degree. And what apparel they were riding in. And at a night, I therefore will begin. And that's the end of sort of like the, the beginning of the frame. It was April. People are going on a trip to Canterbury. 29 of them enter the inn. Chaucer joins them. They're all going to go together. And he's like, and it's important that you know who all these 29 people are. And so now he's going to engage in a description of the various 29 pilgrims that are going on the trip with him. It's important for us to pay attention to these because they're going to be our narrators moving forward. And so Chaucer's going to jump in, like I said last time, with characterization. He's going to give us information about these people who are going to be the voices telling our stories. And Chaucer's going to start at the knight. Why? Because the knight's the top of the feudal pyramid going with them. So he's going to start with rank. He's going to be appropriate to cultural norms. So at a knight, I therefore will begin. Now, one of the things I like about this translation is every time a new character is introduced, they italicize them. So you can go and you can find them that way through the text. There was a knight a most distinguished man, who from the day on which he first began to ride abroad had followed chivalry, truth, honor, generousness, and courtesy. He had done nobly in his sovereign's war and ridden into battle no man more, as well in Christian as in heathen places, and ever honored for his noble graces. So we got a lot of direct characterization here, right? The knight is a distinguished man um, who has always followed chivalry. Uh, we know chivalry from Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which we just read, uh, but he gives us a list of some of those five qualities, truth, honor, generousness, courtesy. Um, he had done nobly in his sovereigns where we find out this guy's a fighter who's fought in battles, um, and he rode into battle. There's nobody in all of England that's probably a hyperbole, um, you know, who's fought in both heathen and Christian places. So he's, he's fought on crusades. He's been, you know, down towards the Holy Land in areas that are occupied by, in this case, Muslims as opposed to Christians. So we're getting a lot of information about this knight. Um, when we took Alexandria, he was there. He often sat at table in the chair of honor above all nations. When in Prussia and Lithuania he had ridden, and Russia, no Christian man so often of his rank. When in Granada, Aldecris sank under assault, he had been there. And in North Africa, raiding... Ben Amarian. Now we can pause here. We're getting a list of places. It's a bunch of name dropping. It's not super important, except that you get the idea this guy's a world traveler. Um, he helped in the crusade that took Alexandria. Uh, he sat in the chair of honor above all nations. So he was like MVP of some of the battles he fought in with the chair of honor at the end of the combat. Uh, he'd been in Prussia and Lithuania and Russia and, you know, all of these places that he has traveled and fought for Christianity against other groups. And the name dropping continues. North Africa raiding Benamarin. In Anatolia, he had been as well and fought when Ayaz and Attilia fell. For all along the Mediterranean coast, he had embarked with many a noble host. Host is an old churchy word for army. Um, in 15 mortal battles he had been and jousted for our faith at Tramasen, thrice in the lists and always killed his man. Tramasen is 
a famous joust where um, Christians and Muslims jousted against each other. This same distinguished knight had led the van once with the Bey of Balat, doing work for him against another heathen Turk. He was of sovereign value in all eyes, and though so much distinguished, he was wise. That's direct characterization. So we've got a lot of indirect characterization about his travels and those sorts of things, but then he just straight up tells you he was wise. Um, and he actually, the knight, is one of the few truly good characters on this, on this pilgrimage. And in bearing modest as a maid, simile, he never yet a boorish thing had said in all his life to any come what might. He was a true, a perfect, gentle knight. Speaking of his equipment, he possessed fine horses, but he was not gaily dressed. He wore a fustane tunic stained and dark with smudges where his armor had left mark. Just home from service, he had joined our ranks to do his pilgrimage and render thanks. This is great uh, indirect characterization that lets you as a reader uh, pull out some interesting stuff about the knight. So let's take a look at what he's wearing. He has fine horses, but he's not gaily dressed. He's not fancy. He's wearing a stained tunic um, with the blood stains and sweat stains that he wore with him when he was on crusade. Uh, so he's not ostentatious. He's not trying to impress anybody. He just, you know, leads sort of by example and people see him and are impressed by who he must have been. Also, he has just come home from crusade. And the first thing that he does when he gets back to England from crusade is goes on a pilgrimage to give thanks to God. So it says he's very religious. So you can, you can pull some good stuff out of this. He had with him his son, a fine young squire, a lover and cadet, a lad of fire, with locks as curly as if they had been pressed. He was some 20 years of age, I guessed. In stature, he was of a moderate length with wonderful agility and strength. He'd seen some service with the cavalry in Flanders and Artorus and Picardy, and had done valiantly in a little space of time and hoped to win his lady's grace. So now we get a second character introduced, a squire. Um, the way, that, the way that Chaucer introduces characters is he introduces characters in groups that are related to each other. So a squire would be um, a knight in training who's going to become a knight. In this case, it's the son of the knight we just introduced. So he has this son with him acting as a squire. And look at the description of this guy. He's a little different from his dad. He's a lover. That's our first description of him, a cadet and a lad of fire. Fire is associated with passion, but also with hell, uh, which is an interesting choice of word on Chaucer's part. Then we get a description of his hair. He has locks as curly as if they had been pressed. He takes a lot of time with his hair to make it like perfect Prince Charming hair. Um, he was some 20 years of age, I guess, so he's a lot younger than his dad. Uh, he's not particularly tall, but he's got great agility and strength, which is important in a fighter. And this guy's a fighter. We get the sense that he's seen service in Flanders, Artorus, and Picardy, and he's, he's done valiantly. So he's doing his dad proud on the battlefield. Um, and it also tells you that he's got a lady. He's trying to win his lady's grace, so he's, he's wearing a lady's favor. He's got a girl that he wants to marry um, or a girlfriend or something like that. Now, he continues. Um, he was embroidered like a meadow bright and full of freshest flowers, red and white. Singing he was or fluting all the day. He was as fresh as is the month of May. Another uh, simile. This guy, as opposed to his dad, who's wearing stained old clothes, is embroidered like a meadow bright. He's got flowers all over his clothes. He's got like the most fashionable outfit. Uh, you can see that here in line 95. Short was his gown. The sleeves are long and wide. Uh, so... He's wearing um, this knight outfit that's very short and tight and shows off his muscles. But he's got like those long bell-bottom sleeves, which were fashionable at the time. So as opposed to his dad, this kid cares about what his hair looks like. He cares about what his shirt looks like. He's, he's very fashionable. Um, let's see. Um, he knew the way to sit a horse and ride. He also is very careful about the way that he rides. He wants to be seen. You know, he wants to ride past the ladies or whatever, and they're like, that guy knows how to ride, right? Like, that's that's his intent very clearly. Um, he could make songs and poems and recite, knew how to joust and dance, to draw and write. He loved so hotly that till the dawn grew pale, he slept as little as a nightingale. Courteous he was, lowly and serviceable, and carved to serve his father at the table. So again, he does everything right for his dad, but we get this little thing in here that he, quote, loved so hotly that till the dawn grew pale, he slept as little as a nightingale. So 
this kid on the 20 year old, I should say, he's not really a kid on the way to Canterbury every night. He doesn't sleep because he's loving hotly. This goes back to, he's a lover and a lad of fire. Um, and he's very interested in his appearance. This guy is like sleeping around all night, but you rewind and you go back to, he had a lady that he was trying to court. What does that say about him? What can we say about his character? He's certainly not like his dad, uh, all right, third guy in this group, the yeoman. Yeoman is a kind of bowman, a forester. Um, sort of picture Robin Hood in your head. That's what a traditional yeoman would be. But this yeoman is the servant of the squire. So we're going sort of down the chain. We go from the knight to the squire to the yeoman. There was a yeoman with him at his side, no other servant, so he chose to ride. This yeoman wore a coat and hood of green, and peacock feathered arrows, bright and keen, and neatly sheathed hung at his belt the while, for he could dress his gear in yeoman style. His arrows never drooped their feathers low. Pause. All right, this guy is, sounds nice, like he's, he's super well dressed. He looks just like a Robin Hood guy should look. But there's a detail here that, as a reader, you should probably pay attention to. Peacock feathered arrows. Arrows are feathered with goose feathers. They're white and very effective. Peacock feathers are ostentatious. Um, this guy is definitely like the squire, very concerned with his looks. Uh, peacock feathered arrows. His arrows never drooped their feathers low, and his hand he bore a mighty bow. Tells you he's strong. His head was like a nut. His face was brown. Wait, what? His head was like a nut? What does that even mean? I'm thinking like a walnut shell that's all like wrinkled and his face is weathered brown. So this guy's been outside in the sun a lot. Uh, he knew the whole of woodcraft up and down. A saucy brace was on his arm to ward it from the bowstring and a shield and a sword hung at one side. And at the other shipped a jaunty dirk, spear sharp and well equipped. So we get a little bit about his equipment. Uh, he's wearing a brace. You know, when you're when you're shooting archery, you have this brace on your arm to protect your arm from the bowstring. He's wearing one, but it's saucy. I I guess it's fashionable. Um, just like everything else that he has, he's he's sort of like a metro uh, yeoman uh, archer. And so then he's got a shield and a sword, and then he's got a dirk, which is a, a kind of dagger or knife, but his is jaunty. It means like he's always whipping it out and like threatening people with it or, or something. It's, it's always, um, it's always there. Spear sharp and well-equipped. A medal of St. Christopher he wore of shining silver on his breast. Uh, he's a patron saint of travelers. Like people have St. Christopher, um, hanging from their, their rear view in the car or something like that. So that's not strange. Uh, it tells that he's well-traveled. Uh, and bore a hunting horn well slung and burnished clean that dangled from a baldric of bright green. He was a proper forester, I guess. So we've got three snapshots of three different characters, the knight and the two guys that are with him. Uh, and you get the sense that the knight himself is a good guy, uh, straight back from pilgrimage or from um, crusades and going on a pilgrimage. He brought his son with him. Not as great a guy, definitely enjoying himself and having a good time. And then we get this yeoman who seems to be like the wingman of the sun. Uh, just like the sun, very interested in his appearance and making sure that everything is in its place. So now we're going to shift to a second group of travelers. These ones are associated with the church. Um, and Chaucer has beef with the church. I think I may have mentioned this before. Chaucer, um, he, he sees various problems with the church and he's going to use satire and conflict between direct and indirect characterization to uh, bring those out. So let's let's see what this nun has to say, or what he has to say about the nun. There was also a nun, a prioress. A prioress is somebody who's in charge of a priory, so like a whole group of nuns, she's the nun who's in charge. Her way of smiling, very simple and coy. Her greatest oath was only, by St. Loy. And she was known as Madame Eglantine. And well, she sang a service with fine intoning through her nose, as was most seemly. And she spoke daintily in French extremely. After the school of Stratford at Bow, French in the Paris style, she did not know. At meat, her manners were well taught with all. No morsel from her lips did she let fall, nor dipped her fingers in the sauce too deep. But she could carry a morsel up and keep the smallest drop from falling on her breast. For courtliness, she had a special zest. She would wipe her upper lip so clean that not a trace of grease was to be seen upon the cup when she had drunk to eat. She reached a hand sedately for the meat. Pause. All right, so 
this sounds like this nun is um, very concerned with manners. Talks about her manners while she's eating and how she doesn't get grease on things. And um, she's super courtly and she speaks French because French is the language of the aristocracy. And all of that seems pretty straightforward until you start reading in between the lines and seeing what Chaucer is doing here. So her way of smiling was very simple and coy. Coy is an interesting word. Let's look up the definition. Coy, adjective, especially with reference to a woman. Making a pretense of shyness or modesty that is intended to be alluring. Meaning acting shy and modest to make other people be attracted to you or interested in you uh, physically. Which, this is a nun, so that's kind of weird. Let's get back to it. She has a, a way of smiling that's like sort of like a come on to people who, who see her. Her greatest oath is by St. Loy. Okay, well, if she's, she doesn't swear, all she says is by St. Loy. Let's find out who St. Loy is. Hold on one second. Loy, or Eloy, is the English name for St. Eligius, who became Bishop of Noyon as a goldsmith to Clothair II, Dagobert I, and Clovis II of France, he was famous for his gold chalices. It's like the patron saint of goldsmithing. Uh, okay, so she has a come on smile and she swears by the saint of goldsmithing. Um, she's known as Madame Eglantine. And well, she sang a service with a fine intoning through her nose, as was most seemly. She has a high-pitched nasal voice. Now, this is something that a modern reader wouldn't get, but it turns out that, and this is unfortunate, but here it is. Um, there was a belief in medieval and Renaissance times that a particular virus, uh, STD, called syphilis, uh, hollowed out your nasal cavities and made you have a high-pitched nasal voice. So is it an implication? We don't know. I mean, it never comes out and says it, but Certainly, that was a common belief, and when you combine it with the fact that she's swearing by the saint of goldsmiths and she's got a coy way of smiling, and then that she speaks daintily in French extremely after the school of Stratford at Bow, uh, French in the Paris style she did not know. Apparently, she's pretending to be French in high class, but her accent sounds terrible. It's a terrible Cockney London accent. So... She does not have a true French accent. It's very clear that she's faking. So this woman seems to be a fake on some level. Um, and then we get the description of her manners. At meat, that means when she's eating meat. Her manners were well taught with all. No morsel from her lips did she let fall, nor dipped her fingers in the sauce too deep, but could carry a morsel up and keep the smallest drop from falling on her breast. Why are we mentioning her breast? She's a nun. That's weird. Um, <clears throat> for courtliness, she had a special zest and would wipe her upper lip so clean that not a trace of grease was to be seen upon the cup when she had drunk. To eat, she reached a hand sedately for the meat. I mean, is this an oddly sexual description. What's going on with this nun? What is Chaucer saying? I mean, on the surface, she's she's a nun. But let's keep reading, shall we? Maybe there's something we can pull out of this. Um, she certainly was very entertaining. Is that a word, an adjective that we apply to a nun? Pleasant and friendly in her ways and straining to counterfeit, in other words, to fake a courtly kind of grace, a stately bearing fitting to her place, and to seem dignified in all her dealings. So she's always trying to fake being high class, being dignified, uh, acting like a nun. As for her sympathies and tender feelings, she was so charitably solicitous. She used to weep if she but saw a mouse caught in a trap, if it were dead or bleeding. And she had little dogs she would be feeding with roasted flesh or milk or fine white bread. Wait, hold on. Do nuns have dogs? Generally speaking, no. This woman seems to have little dogs that she takes with her. And not only that, but she feeds them like fancy feast delicacies. She's giving them little bits of meat and milk and fine white bread. A nun is supposed to have sort of taken a vow of poverty. And when she has things like this, she doesn't give them to her dogs. She gives them to the poor who need these things. So... This characterization seems to imply that, you know, she's not very nunnish. She's not much like a nun at all. Um, and bitterly she wept if one were dead. Um, whoa, I just 
lost my spot uh, over at the end of the page. Or someone took a stick and made it smart. She was all sentiment and tender heart. Her veil was gathered in a seemly way. Her nose was elegant, her eyes glass gray. Her mouth was very small, but soft and red. Her forehead certainly was fair of spread, almost a span across the brows I own. She was indeed by no means undergrown. Pause, now we get a physical description of her. Uh, and this makes her medieval super hot. Uh, standards of beauty have changed between then and now. Uh, we talked a little bit about this with the lady in um, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, but she's wearing a veil that's gathered in a seemly way designed to make her look beautiful and alluring. Um, her nose is elegant, her eyes glass gray. That's Guinevere's eye color in King Arthur stories, the most beautiful at the time eye color that you could have. Her mouth is very small. Small mouths are attractive. Go back and look at paintings from medieval times of beautiful women. They all have these little tiny red mouths. Um, her forehead certainly was fair. She also has a really big forehead. That was attractive back in the day. I mean, I would be hot back in the day if I had a big old forehead like this. Nowadays, we style our hair differently, but you, you wonder why Shakespeare wore his hair the way he did and why so many people from that time period looked like him, because having a big old span of a forehead was, was an attractive thing. Um, but then it says she was indeed by no means undergrown. This woman's plump. She's, she's kind of beefy, which was attractive back then, A, because, you know, the, the noble lords wanted to have um, sons that would be able to fight and do those sorts of things. So they wanted a relatively large uh, mate to have... Uh, relatively large and athletic sons with, uh, but also women who were who were too small often died in childbirth without um, the kinds of, of medicine that we have nowadays. And uh, also, most people who were poor were starving, and they were skinny and scrawny. And so, having somebody who was bigger was attractive. It, it turns out that attraction is what's hard to achieve. People like things that are outside of the norm. Um, back then, it was normal for women to be tanned because they were out, you know, working in the fields because they were poor. Uh, and so the standard of beauty wanted women to be as pale as humanly possible. Uh, it was normal to be skinny, and so the standard of beauty wanted them to be be plump, uh, as opposed to now, where it's very easy to be fat and pale, and we want women to be um, you know, fit and tanned, both hard to achieve things. Um, so I think this is, this is an interesting situation. Uh, last little bit about her, her, her cloak, I noticed had a graceful charm. She wore a coral trinket on her arm. Do, do nuns wear jewelry? A set of beads, the gaudies tricked in green, whence hung a golden brooch of brightest sheen, on which there was first graven a crowned A and a lower Amor Vincent Ammonia, which translates to love conquers all things. This is this is the piece of jewelry she's wearing. Love conquers all things. So what's going on with this nun? Let's look at the, the who she's traveling with because that tells you something too. Another nun, the secretary at her cell, was riding with her and three priests as well. Wait a minute. Nuns and priests don't travel together, right? For obvious reasons. Nuns keep the nuns and priests keep the priests. They're both supposed to be celibate. What are nuns and priests doing together? Actually, when you get to the nuns' priest tale later, the priests aren't introduced here. These priests are big and thuggish. So Chaucer seems to have set up a situation in which he's literally, through direct characterization, telling us that this woman's a nun. But there's a lot of insinuation that maybe she's not a nun at all. I mean, her attractiveness, her little dogs, her fake accent, um, the way that she smiles at people is sort of like a come on smile. Uh, the fact that she, she swears by the saint of goldsmiths, uh, the way that her eating of meat is described in an oddly sexual way. Is she a nun or is she a whore? What's going on here? Chaucer never tells us, but there's some implications here. Nuns and priests don't ride together. These priests are these like her pimps or bodyguards. Like, I don't know what's going on here, but certainly as a reader, you've got to, you've got to ask yourself, what is this? And if this is what maybe Chaucer is implying, then he's highlighting a problem with the church. How do you know if somebody's really involved with the church or not? 
there were no IDs back then. There were no social security numbers. People had to assume that based on what you were wearing was sort of your uniform for who you were. And if this woman is not a nun, if say she's a strumpet, we use a medieval word, um, who's here, you know, to profit, uh, you know, from the pilgrims, then this is a perfect cover for her. On a pilgrimage, why wouldn't you be a nun? People are going to be like, I'm going to confession. Uh, and then they could do whatever they, they wanted to do. So it's pretty crazy that Chaucer is going to put this character in here and leave all of these hints. And it's funny to a medieval reader, but it also makes them scratch their head and think like, yeah, why don't we have a way to identify who's really involved with the church and who's not? They just tell us uh, that they are, and, and we sort of have to believe them. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll do one more character, and then we'll call this done, and we'll stop for the day, and we'll come back and look at some more in the next video. A monk there was, one of the finest sort who rode the country, hunting was his sport. So another church figure. This one's not riding with them. It's it's a the sort of the third group. The first group was the knight, the squire, and the yeoman. The second group was a nun another nun and three priests, and the third grouping is going to start with a monk. Uh, now, a monk, as you might imagine, most people have an image of monk in their head that goes to, like, um, Buddhists, like the Buddhist monk. Um, a Christian monk is supposed to have taken a vow of poverty, is supposed to live, uh, you know, with his threadbare, um, you know, hair tunic and give everything that he gets to the poor and live in solitude and take vows of silence and, and things like that. So take that image, which you should have in your head of a monk living in a monastery, uh, studying the Bible all the time, and apply that to what we're given here. And let's think about what Chaucer is trying to say about monks and about some of the problems with the church. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. A monk there was, one of the finest sort, who rode the country, hunting was his sport. A manly man, to be an abbot able, many a dainty horse he had in stable. His bridle, when he rode, a man might hear, jingling in a whistling wind as clear, ay, and as loud as does the chapel bell, where my lord monk was prior of the cell. So he's the chief monk of all the monks, but his favorite pastime is hunting. Is that square with being a monk to you? Uh, also, he's got a bunch of horses in his stable. Uh, his his horses are tricked out, you know, like he's got jingling bells all over them. Um, the rule of good St. Bennet or St. Mauer, as old and strict, he tended to ignore. Um, the rule is the, the vow of poverty. He just ignores it. He's not interested in being poor. Um, he let go by the things of yesterday and took the modern world's more spacious way. He did not rate that text at a plucked hen, which says that hunters are not holy men, and that a monk uncloistered is a mere fish out of water flapping at the pier. That is to say, a monk out of his cloister, that was a text he held not worth an oyster. So this guy has read in the Bible that hunters are not holy men. Priests should not be hunters. He ignores it. He's he's read that he's supposed to have taken a vow of poverty. He ignores it. He's read that monks are supposed to stay in the monetary monastery, and he ignores it. Uh, interesting. And I agreed and said his views were sound. Was he to study till his head went round, poring over books and cloisters? Must he toil as Austin bade and till the very soil? Was he to leave a world upon a shelf? Let Austin have his labor to himself. This monk, therefore, a good man to horse. Greyhounds he had, as swift as birds to course. Hunting a hare or riding at a fence was all his fun. He spared for no expense. So the guy has a bunch of dogs with him, hunting dogs, that he pays for. Now, by the way, how's he paying for the dogs? How's he paying for the horses? Who's funding his hunting excursions? The church is the answer. And Chaucer is got a bone to pick with this. Why Why should members of the church be able to leave, live this life of luxury, spending their time hunting instead of doing the work of the church? Uh, people make the same sort of claims about uh, American politicians who spend time golfing instead of doing their job. Uh, it's the same sort of idea. And who pays for that golfing? You know, the, the people of the United States, people were, were upset about Obama when he went golfing. People were upset about Trump when he went golfing, right? It's the same sort of idea here, except this guy's a member of the church and he's not spending his time doing church stuff. He's spending his time enjoying himself out hunting. Well, let's see. I saw his sleeves are garnished at the hand with fine gray fur, the finest in the land. And on his hood to fasten it at his chin, he had a rock gold cunningly fashioned pin. Into a lover's knot it seemed to pass. 
His head was bald and shone like a looking glass. So did his face as if it had been greased. He was a fat and personable priest. All right, so he's got gold jewelry, fur-lined robes, as opposed to the threadbare, like, uh, poverty robes he should be wearing. Um, and he's fat. And not only is he fat, he's greasy. He's, like, shining with... I mean, that's how much meat he eats, I guess. Uh, he was a fat and personable priest. His prominent eyeballs never seemed to kettle, settle. They glittered like flames beneath a kettle. Supple his boots, his horse in fine condition. He was a prelate fit for exhibition. He was not pale like a tormented soul. He liked a fat swan best and roasted whole. His palfrey was as brown as a berry. The last little bit we get about this guy is that he likes a roasted swan. I mean, it's like sitting down to a Thanksgiving dinner with a whole turkey to yourself and eating it. That's what this guy does. No wonder he's fat. He's living off the church's money and he's living this extravagant lifestyle. Chaucer's pointing out a problem with medieval society. So in case you don't know about medieval society, one of the problems that they had was in order to keep, if you're a lord, say, and you have three sons, in order to keep your property together, all of it goes to the firstborn son. He gets everything. So what do you do with the other two sons? Well, traditionally, if you have a second or third born son and uh, your firstborn son is going to inherit, you would give them a career in the church. And they would go and they would become, you know, high ranking members of the church because uh, they're a Lord's son and you have connections and contacts. Well, what happens if, if you make somebody a monk, say? in the church and he doesn't care to be a monk uh, a lot of these guys who became monks and abbots and uh archbishops and bishops and all those kinds of things they just came from from royal families and they didn't change their lifestyle they went and instead of the lifestyle being supported by their dad the lifestyle was supported by the church this guy goes and he hunts for and, and spends the church's money that should be feeding the poor um and, and helping the sick and doing the kinds of work that the church is supposed to be doing. And he's spending it hunting to enjoy himself because that's the lifestyle he's used to and the only thing he's interested in. He's not particularly holy. His parents put him into the church and he's just, you know, living his best life. And this is a problem. And Chaucer's trying to highlight the problem in a way that's funny. This guy's kind of funny, let's be honest. Uh, this fat monk riding around on a horse and hunting with greyhounds, he's funny. But it's a problem. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, hopefully you're starting to see some of the things that Chaucer's doing with these characters and the conflict between direct and indirect characterization and how it's working out. Uh, I'm going to read the rest of the prologue in the next video.